Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, to, today's store portion is called Beha Alotka, which means when you set up. And uh, and uh, if you're new to the channel, again, we are a Messianic congregation. We are based in Mississauga, Ontario. For more information about our ministry, you can certainly join. Uh, you can uh, you can uh, find us in the web in our website, or you can join us via Zoom. And our Zoom credentials are there every Shabbat morning at ten thirty Eastern Standard Time, Toronto time. And um, so again, our Torah portion is taken from Numbers chapter, beginning with chapter eight. Verse 1 to chapter 12, verse 16. So again, why do we study the Torah? Because the Torah is the word of God. And the word of God brings instruction and truth. And we're here to learn about God's instruction and his truth. So uh, before that, we could just follow you. I just want to thank you for the privilege to not only hear the word, but to, to, uh, to learn your word in our hearts, in our lives. May you transform the lives of your people by the by the by the hearing of your word we ask in Yeshua the Messiah. And everybody said, Amen. 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 So to, today, uh, there's a uh, it, it, there's a lot of lessons to be learned here, and I'm going to talk about uh, to, today. What I'm going to talk about, about the tribes and the marching order. And I'm talking about the ministry of the levy and how that is different from the priesthood. We're going to see how the clouds of glory. And the blowing of the shofar, shofar is pointing to Yeshua the Messiah. And I'm going to explain um, why they said that the book of Numbers is actually three books. So I'm going to try to explain that. And uh, that's why they said that the Torah is not five books, it's seven books. And we're going to explain that. And then finally, uh, we're going to see the, uh, the, the result or the consequence of the children of Israel rejecting the manna, which is the Torah, which is the word of God that he led to, to their destruction. And we're we're going to learn from, from their mistakes. Amen? The Torah is there to uh, to show us, not to, to imitate the mistakes of our forefathers, but for us to learn. Amen? So if you're ready, yes, see? So we go to the first slide. So it's, it's interesting because uh, this is the a bird's eye view of the camp of Israel. You'll notice that this is how they were encamped. So if there was a, 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 a drone during the time, you will see a cross. Isn't is that interesting? You will see a cross in the camp of Israel. So you will learn that the center of the, the cross, of course, is the tabernacle, and around it are the priests and the Levites, Moses and Aaron on the east, the Kohites on the south, Gershon on the west, and Merari on the north, and of course, the different tribes, uh, according to their numbers, Issachar, Judah, and Zebulun, Simeon, Reuben, and Gad, Manasseh, Ephraim, Benjamin, and Asher, Dan, and Naphtali. So, so it's interesting because you'll see here that uh, God even encouraged that every tribe, say that every tribe, Everybody. would have their own flag. They would have their own banner. So each of the tribe would, uh, like the, the, the tribe of Judah, they would have a lion as their, as their banner. Lion. Are you still here? Lion. So why is that? So why is that? Because God is encouraging uh, diversity. Why? <laughs> diversity is good. In fact, it strengthens them, Right? The only time that when uh, diversity turns to be a weakness is when they start to have hatred or division among themselves. So God says, you know, I don't want you to just be one tribe. He wants you to be 12 different tribes, 12 different expressions on how they would worship God. Amen. I still hear. So God wanted, uh, uh, and, and, and we learned that historically, that was the basis for the destruction of the second temple. And still true, still true today. Why? Because they there's so, so there's so much division today in Israel, even within the the, the 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 Israeli nation, as we prayed earlier. There's a lot of division within, you know, the uh, the leadership. There's a lot of division, as you as you learn, in the last, I think, five years they had over seven different elections. Right? There's so much division within. So 
So uh, it, 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 it's not good. The vision will, uh, so God desires a variety of service and worship. It's not one size fits all as seen in the, uh, we'll see that in the ideal holy nation depicted in the tabernacle. So go on the next slide. So I wanted to, to share this, the marching order as uh, uh, Brother Charles read to us, there was a silver trumpet that was that was commissioned to be created. And uh, the, the, the silver trumpet, they, they, they had different warning sound, they have different sounds uh, to prepare them. And, and when, when it was a long blast, is to, is to prepare them, to warn them to start packing your clothes, amen? And then uh, there was a second warning that uh, you should be packing your tents or whatever. So to, it's, it, it's a marching order when you see prophetically. So, so the, of course, the first one to leave, of course, the cloud of glory lifted. When they saw the cloud of glory lifted, the Ark of the Covenant came first. So the Ark of the Covenant, uh, led by uh, the, the, the Kohites, uh, the, the tribe of Kohites, they would carry the Ark of the Covenant. And behind them is number one, Aaron and Mo Aaron, Moses and Miriam's family. And then number two, Judah. Judah, the, the tribe of Judah. Number three, Issachar. Number four, Zebulun. And number five, Gershon. And then Mirari. Number seven is the tribe of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. And number 10 is the tribe of Kohat. The remaining... Uh, uh, tribe of Kohat, where they brought the altar, the incense altar, the menorah. And then uh, Ephraim was next. Manasseh, number 12. Benjamin, number 13. And Dan would uh, would move, but he would stay in the back and allow uh, the, the tribe of Asher and Naphtali uh, to move on. The, the tribe of Ash, the tribe of Dan was the last of the tribes, and they were in charge to ensure that if there's anything left behind, they will, they will, they're the one who established the lost and found. Amen. Let's say, uh, Brother Edwin forgot his kettle. <laughs> it has his name there, Edwin. So he would go to the tribe of Dan and say, Dan, did you find my kettle? And they said, Yeah, we found your kettle. He was still sitting on the stove. You left the stove as well. <laughs> Amen. Are you still here? So, um, yeah, it's important that. Uh, you know, uh, there's a there's a there's a method. There is a uh, process. So uh, we also learn in this Torah portion on the next side that the Levites they were anoint they were they, they were anointed by by God. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, "Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them." And we learn that. Verse nine: They shall present the Levites before the tent meeting and the and the assembly of the whole congregation of the children of Israel. And thou shalt present the Levites before the Lord, and the children of Israel shall lay their hands on the Levites. So that you get, can you imagine that you know in, during the in the in the wilderness they were laying hands. The people were laying hands on each other. They were laying hands on the tribe of Levi. They were anointing them. They were commissioning them. Amen. Are you still here? So they were commissioning them. Why? Because the Levites represents the firstborn. We said last time the role of the firstborn is very critical because the firstborn is the connection to the parents and to the younger siblings, right? The firstborn is the one that that understands the heart of the, the parent. In this case, the Levites understand the heart of God. And then the Levites, because he's also a child, of the parents understands the hearts of the siblings. So the, the, the role of the Levites are very important. And we said there that the ministry of the Levites uh, to serve God, represent him in the world. And uh, that's who we are. We are the ambassadors like God. We, we are to serve God and, our, and, and we are to serve God and reflect the God that we serve in how we treat our brothers and sisters, right? Amen. So you said, go to the next slide. So we, we learned that the Levites start their ministry. Um, they, they, they start their official work at, at the age of 30. 
right? And and uh, and I'm gonna explain because it, it's a misnomer. It's a Levite that starts at age thirty, the official work, and then they retire at age fifty. Say that they 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 start at thirty, and they retire at fifty. So look at this numbers from thirty years old and upwards until the fifty years old. They shall enter upon the service and the work. In the Lord's uh, verse 8, this is a Torah portion. This is what pertains to the, Levi, the Levites from 25 years old. So from 25 years old, they start as a apprentice or as a, what do you call that? Student. Yeah. Training. Training. Apprentice. Okay. Uh, what is called that? Um, yeah. The one that, uh, you know, as a student. That's a right. training. Right. And then. At 30 years old is when they officially are able to do it. So they, there's a five-year training. And then at 30, then they can they can do the work. And then at age 50, they retire. At the age of 50 years, they shall return from the service of work and shall serve no more. So they, they only have a 20 years, well, 25 years shelf life. Amen? <laughs> are you still here? They, they already get pension after age 50. Wow. Next, next slide. So we also learned that the priesthood, on the other hand, they don't have an age limit. Are you still here? So the priest, the only thing that will disqualify the priest, in other words, the priest can serve until 90 if he's able to. Are you still here? There's no retirement age for the priest. Okay? The only thing that will disqualify them, it says, it says in, in the video chapter 16, and she to Aaron saying, Whosoever set me thy seed throughout your generation that has a blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of, of, of his God. So, verse 8 For whatsoever man he that has a blemish, he shall not approach a blind or lame. We said that there are spiritual and physical uh, meaning behind this. We don't have time to explain it, but there are 12 blemishes that will disqualify the priest from serving. So, the Levites say that the Levites, they are limited by their age. Say that they're limited by their age. If the Levites, for example, is blind, say that if the Levite is blind, he can still serve. Say that he can still serve. Why? Because the physical, the physical blemish does not disqualify him. Are you still here? But if he is 51 years old, that means what? He cannot serve anymore. He retired. Okay. The priest, on the other hand, say that the priest, on the other hand, even though he's just twenty-five years old, say at twenty-five, or he's fifty-one, he can still serve. Say that he can still serve. Why? Because the priest is not disqualified by what? By age. But they're disqualified by what? By any blemish. If he's a broken hand, he cannot serve until he heals his hand. Am I still here? Clear so far? So why is that important? Why is that important? See, why is that important? What is the lesson that God is trying to convey here? Why? Because generally, see that generally, the work of the Levim, the Levites, they are the ones that sing. So when in, during during the temple time, they would have choirs, they would have, they would be the praise and worship leader. So when the when the sacrifice is being brought. They would sing, the say that the, the Levites will be singing, say that they will be singing. On top of, of course, uh, during the wilderness, they would be the one assembling and disassembling. But remember when the permanent structure, the temple was established in, in, in Jerusalem, they didn't need to move anything. So the, the primary work is for them to teach, say that to teach and to sing, say that to sing. They were the ones that were singing. They were the ones that were clapping. Amen. Are still here? Yeah. So, so the, 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 the primary task is to do the singing, the playing the instrument, the vocal instruments. And then, um, of course, uh, uh, so, the, 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 so the, the, the service compared to the priest, the priest's work is very precise. Say that it's very precise. The, the, the work of the priest is very precise. It's very exacting. It's uh, it's uh, it's 
it's almost repetitive. Like remember, remember there's a lamb slain in the morning, the tamid, the, the lamb in the morning, and then there's the, the lamb in the evening. So if, if that's the only sacrifice for the day, their work is very precise. It has the, the animal has to be slaughtered a, 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 a certain way. The blood has to spill, has to be spilled a certain way. Amen. Are you still here? Yeah. In fact, they said, let's say the, the priest is wearing his priestly garment. And all of a sudden, he feels like I want to wear a tie. You know, he's wearing his priestly garment, and then he decides that he wants to wear a necktie today. According to the Jewish writing, the moment that he, he adds anything on top of what is required for him to wear, all the things that he will do that day will be void. It will be void. Can you imagine just wearing a necktie to make him look more professional? God said, no, no, no. Say that, no, no, no. Why? Because the priest is, the, the work of the priest, say that the work of the priest the work of the priest. is very precise. Yes. It's very exacting. It's not even a word. Amen? It's, uh, it's very, um, it's, 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 it's uh, it doesn't change. It doesn't change. Yes. That's why, if you think about it, if you are in a profession that is very, repetitive, you know, it's the same thing all over and over again. You'll notice that the more, the older you are, say yeah, the older you are, yeah, the better you are at it. Why? Because you know exactly how it works. Are you still here? That's why age is not an issue. Yes? Yeah. However, say however, the work of the Levim, which is singing, which is, which is, requires a lot of passion, say the passion, Requires a lot of emotion. Are you still here? Yeah. And and passion and emotion is important, but some but you cannot sometimes you cannot sustain that, right? Unlike the, the role of the priest, you know, whether he you know he had a bad day in the morning or not, his work will have to happen, right? His emotion is not affected by his work, right? Yeah. He's gonna slaughter, you know, it is it's However, for the Levim, for the for the for the Levites, their work is impacted by how they felt. Let's say they didn't feel like singing today. Amen. So that's why in the work of the Levim, there's a lot of emotion and passion that will lead to burnout, right? If if if, uh, if, if it's done on a prolonged period of time, like what like for example, a good example is when. When uh, there's a fire, I remember uh, when uh, Eleanor and I were were uh, uh, we we just uh, were having I mean, uh, Alfie was already born. So anyway, we were living in in an apartment, and and there was an area in, in our back that started to burn. And I tell you, my my neighbor, they well for us we were we were not worried. We didn't, but our neighbor they literally took their fridge out of the out of the home, right? And after all of that, nobody has the energy anymore to bring it back. I, I tell you. Why? Because at, at a moment, there's an adrenaline, there's an emotion, say that emotion, emotion. that drives you, that, that, that's, that makes you physically able to do something that, like, like for example, a mother, when it, the car flipped and her, their daughter is under the car. What you 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 you'll be surprised that that mother is able to lift that car yes. to save her daughter. Are you still here? But the but the point of of God is that type of behavior, that type of job is not sustainable over time because it will lead to, it will lead to burnout. See, that it will lead to burnout. That's why for the Levine, even though they have a blemish. If you're blind, you can still sing. Are you still here? Yeah. If you're blind, you can still play the instrument, right? But the thing that will disqualify them is their age. Why? Because God said, okay, you, you've done enough of your time. So you can retire now. Amen? Are you still here? Yeah. So I, I wanted to explain that because uh, we need to understand that God has called us. Say that God has called us to be Levites and to be priests, right? And in, 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 when the Messiah returns, he will make us uh, uh, to be the Levites, priests, firstborn and priests. And we need to be um, 
precise, meaning to follow God's word. At the same time, we need to be um, doing it with passion. With uh, remember when they were singing, uh, except during during uh, uh, during pa uh, Pesach or during the holidays, they had specific sound that they would sing. But uh, anytime during during the week during the day, they would uh, sometimes they would improvise. Why? Because you know if uh, you know they felt like being a uh, singing jazz this morning, they will be singing jazz or, you know, whatever. So they, 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 had, they had a lot of improvisation. But the priest, the word is very precise. It's the same day in and day out. Amen, Isilio. So God wants us to worship him the same way. We worship him in, in, in like we, 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 we pray liturgical prayer. You know, if we pray liturgical prayer, also we, we pray from our heart. Amen. So God wants both. Say God wants both. From us, amen. So, um, um, if you go to the next slide, so we're, 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 we're going to look at the clouds of glory. We learned that uh, about the mysterious clouds of glory, which sometimes dwelled among the people of Israel in the tabernacle, and sometimes they went before the people, showing them the way to go. And this points towards the Messiah who will dwell among us. And lead us the same way in number chapter 9, verse, verse 6 says there. So it was always the cloud covered it and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever the cloud was taken from over the tent, then after the children of Israel, the, uh, the children of Israel journeyed, and in the place where the cloud abode or stayed, there the children of Israel come. So, in other words, they were looking at the cloud. See, they were looking at the cloud. For their direction. If the cloud left, they have to follow the cloud. Are you still here? Yeah. And if the cloud left, what happened? If the cloud lifted, what happened? The silver trumpet, the shofar started to come out. And the instructions. So because there was no cell phone there, there was no cell phone. Right? So the way they communicated was to signal. When they hear a long blast, it's a sign for them to prepare. Amen, it's in here. To prepare themselves. And uh, so here we see here that the, 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 uh, throughout Israel's journey through the wilderness, the angel of the Lord, as uh, we read there, uh, and, uh, accompanied them in the form of the cloud of glory. The cloud lifted to show when to move, and then it traveled ahead to show them the way. Verse 22, look at this. Go next time. You see verse 22 there? Whether it was two days or a month or a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle, abiding thereon, the children of Israel remained in camp and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they would journey. So they were they were following the tabernacle. They were following where the tabernacle go. Go next time. When the, when the cloud stopped, the Israel, Israel knew it was time to come. When the cloud lifted, the priest made a special kind of sound of the trumpet that was called uh, tekiah. That's a long uninterrupted trumpet blast. Another kind of blast was the priest used it called teruah. It was a series of tekato trumpet blasts that was used to assemble the nations. There are all sorts of trumpet blasts, and in the Jewish history, from a series of blasts used to declare the onset of various festivals and Shabbat to invoke the divine assistance in battle. And other things. Go next slide. So we see here that they found uh, when they were digging the archaeological uh, sites, they found that on the edge of of the wall, they found this. This uh, this rock here, and it has the inscri inscription that it was where the shofar blower will stand. So he was in the pinnacle. Say that he's the, in the pinnacle of the temple. Remember when uh, Yeshua was being tempted, and uh, the, the the enemy brought him into the pinnacle of the temple. So that's where Yeshua was standing. He was standing at the edge of the the, the highest uh, place in the temple. That is where the shofar blower is blowing the trumpet. Are you still here? Yeah. So uh, uh, 
So the 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 trumpet blast is carried in our in various holidays. It says there there in the midrash there are six blasts were blown on Friday evening. Say that six blasts are blown on Friday evening before Shabbat. The first one warned them to start stop working, prepare them to stop working. And the second one warned the people, the city, to cease work or to 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 uh, to prepare them to stop working. And then the second blast is to for them to stop working. And the third one is for them to light the Shabbat candle. So so again, the, the God is uh, 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 is is uh, is preparing us. And the, the the sound of the shofar is a warning, or also to to remind us. It's a reminder, like an alarm clock. Amen. Amen. I use that every morning. My wife can get mad at me. I have so many alarms. You know, this one first, this one. <laughs> and then finally, when the when the last alarm, oh my gosh, boom, boom. That, that's the one. That's the one. I have to take out the dog, I have to feed the dog, whatever. So that one makes you jump. Amen. I still here. So that the temples, uh, so we learn that. Uh, in go on the next slide, yes, there, 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 there is a hidden message because the it says there on the day in Amos, in Amos chapter 9, verse 11, in that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. So there's a messianic prophecy it's talking about the, 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 the building of the third temple. Which remember, the second temple was destroyed, and the Hebrew word for fallen there is the word netli, which you can also pronounce it. To be nephele, nephele, which means cloud. So in Daniel chapter 7, this is a name of the Messiah. One of the messianic names is the name of the Messiah is his name as the cloud. Say that this is the cloud. In, in, in Daniel, Daniel saw a vision. Behold, there come with the clouds of heaven. Say that the clouds of heaven. One like the Son of Man. So here he's referring to. The Messiah being called the cloud from heaven. Say that, cloud from heaven. Wow, say wow. It says there too, that one of the descendants of David, talking about his, his generation, one of his descendants will be named Anani. Say that, Anani. Which literally means cloud. Say that, cloud. So, so it's referring to, it's actually a messianic prophecy about the coming Messiah. He's coming from the line of David. Amen. Right? We know that. And his name will be called Clouds of Glory. The clouds. Say that. Clouds of Glory. So in um, in the next slide, you see here that in Matthew chapter 24, look at this. This is the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the tribes of the land will mourn. They will see the man, the Son of Man, coming on the clouds of heaven. So the same prophecy that Daniel saw, the clouds of heaven. Amen. I feel it. The Son of Man coming down yeah. with tremendous power and glory. He will send out his angels with a great shofar. Remember, when they saw the cloud lift, what, they, what happened next? Say that. When the, when the cloud lifted, what happened next? The trumpet came out. Amen. I feel here. Yeah. There was a blast of the trumpet. To warn the people, prepare yourself. Pack your clothes. Are you still here? Yeah. Pack your tents. Pack your kettle, Mr. Edwin. Yeah. Are you still here? And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a rousing cry and a call from one of the ruling angels and with a God so far, those who died united with the Messiah will rise first. Then we who are left alive will be caught up with the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Look, I tell you a secret. Not all of you will die. I'm telling you, not all of you will die. See that? Not all of you will die. Amen. But you will be changed. It will take but a moment, the blink of an eye. At the final shofar, the shofar will sound and the dead will be raised to live forever. Amen? And you will forever be changed. Amen? So so uh, um, it's a messianic prophecy. One of his titles is the clouds of heaven. That is God's name, Yeshua's name. 
Nef Nefeli. Let's say that Nefeli. That's one of his names. Amen. Uh, we're going to go into the book of Bab Mir by going next there. So, so, so it says there that the book of Mad, the, the book of Numbers, uh, the first few chapters, uh, Torah portion of Bab Midbar, Naso, and part of Beha Alatka is, uh, is they said is book one. Um, very interesting observation. Basically, the the midbar can be divided in two sec three sections, three books. Parts about midbar Naso and parts of Beha Alotka, Numbers chapter one one to nine, and of course it's very unequal. And then book two happens. Now book one is when the Jewish people are finally commanded to leave Mount Sinai and the Sinai Desert. Uh, virtually more than 11 months, almost a year, when they came out of Egypt. And book two is finally Israel starts to move. And the book is uh, is two is two verses long. It's in Numbers chapter 10, where Brother Charles read to us, chapter 10, verse 35. When the ark moved forward, Moshe said, Arise, Adonai. May your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And verse 36, when it came, when it stopped, it said, Return Adonai to the many, many thousands of Israel. And, and we'll we'll see there later. I'm going to show you that that verse is uh, separated by two inverted noons, letter, letter noon, inverted. And of course, uh, the next book, the third book, is the uh, is anything after uh, chapter eleven is book three. In Proverbs chapter nine, it says, "Their wisdom has built her house and has hewn her in seven pillars." So we see here that because the book of Numbers, they said, is actually three books. So therefore, there are really seven Torah porch, uh, Torah book Genesis. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers book one, Numbers book two, Numbers book three, and then Deuteronomy. So, so uh, that's how uh, if if, uh, if somebody will ask you how many uh, Torah books there are, the correct answer is what? Seven. Seven. Okay. Amen? Seven. Verse one. So uh, book two is only two verses. So, but what's the significance of the, the, the of the division? I'll go to the next slide, Jesse. So we see here that the, so uh, you see here that uh, the book two is uh, two noons that are inverted. This is a normal way to write a letter noon, but it's inverted and that it's separated the book. So, what's the significance of the division of number one and number two? What is the significance of the uh, feature of the backward noon? So there's a, a ancient rabbi, Rabbi Sadok, says a very, very explanation. The book of Bad Bidbar is book one, is the ideal society. It lays out the Mishkan in the middle and the Levim and the priests around the Mishkan and it explains the unity within the different tribes living within in the wilderness. So it's talking about what will the, what will the ideal kingdom of God look like. So book one is uh, Numbers chapter one to chapter nine is is showing us what God's kingdom will look like in the future. Book three, on the other on the other hand, is when they started to disintegrate from the ideal reality because of sin. Uh, the story of the quail incident, the story of the Korah rebellion, the story of the Moabite. Uh, and of course, the the spies, the uh, the twelve spot, the, the the ten spies. So, in other words, in the sense, book one set out the ideal world, the ideal kingdom of God. Book three shows us the disintegration of that world because of sin. And book two, say that book two, the two verses is the key to understanding how we can go back to the ideal and not go 
to the to the uh, disintegration. Amen. I say, say here. So say the sages say the ancient rabbis say that describing um, the journey away. Go to the next slide, James. The journey uh, that they took away from the tabernacle from Mount Sinai. Sorry, from Mount Sinai. They said that when the, the when the cloud finally left or or or, or lifted. Authorizing them to, uh, to to move to the promised land, the the, the sages described the uh, the attitude of the Jewish people as something like you know when when a kid when the final bell rings, right? They're, they're sitting on their desk and then the ring ah they started running. So the so the, so the sages described that the the attitude of the children of Israel. They, they they were so anxious to get out of Mount Sinai. Say that. They, did, they didn't want to stay in Mount Sinai any longer. Why? Say that why? Because God started to teach Moses laws upon laws, upon commands, upon commands. And they said, the longer we stay here, God might give us more commands. Are you still here? So there was, in the Jewish writing, it says, the children of Israel were, were so excited to leave the, the in Mount Sinai where, where God's presence was 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 <laughs> where God gave the Torah, his word, because they didn't want to, they don't want to hear another. God might change his mind and give us more laws. Are you still here? So they were excited. They, they were excited to leave there. Are you still here? Just like a child waiting for the final bell. So he can go to the playground. I tell him. So they left Mount Sinai with enthusiasm. They were excited to leave the presence of God. I tell him. I tell him. So with passion because they, they were afraid. They figured, hey, we've been here a year and God gave us so many commands already. How many more if we stay longer? So they wanted to leave right away. So it didn't really help them. But nevertheless, because later on, God added more, even though they left Mount Sinai, right? We know that, that God added more laws to them. But you see here that the, the attitude, the, the, so, so what, what the, 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 the sages, the Rav Sadok, for example, says, how you go from book one to book three is based on the attitude you had towards what? Towards the service of God. Are you excited? To serve God or you're not. So in this case, they were not excited to do this mitzvah, this commandment. Are you still here? So as a result, he says there, for them, the commandments, say that the commandments was like a burden to them. Say, are you still here? Why? Say that why? Why? Because they didn't look at the Torah the same way we do today. That's why. You know, we're going to learn that this, this this prayer that we prayed before we read the Torah came later when the when the first temple was destroyed. It was was created by by the sages. Why? Because they wanted to make sure that when you're reading the Word of God, you are excited. You are. It's a privilege for you. Amen. Still here. Amen. Because their attitude was, you know, they want to get out of God's presence as soon as possible. And so, and as a result, say that as a result, uh, you know, it, it, it led to, we're going to see that later on, but if, if you go, it says here in, in Rab Sadak's, uh, uh, it, it, it says that the ideal book, uh, the, the ideal, the ideal of book one is the, the holy ideal, book three is the disintegration of the ideal, book two is the transition based on leaving Mount Sinai, what attitude the people of Israel had or with the word of God, right? That's why it's, it's there's another example. They said in the Gemora, in, uh, in, in the prophet Isaiah, when, they, when, when Isaiah was describing why the first temple was getting, was getting destroyed, Isaiah was not clear as to why. Of course, there was, there was the sin of idolatry. There was the sin of sexual immorality and, of course, murder. But 
Isaiah was saying, God, why are you destroying the temple? The people are, st are studying the Torah. They're learning the Torah. Why are you destroying it? So, so Isaiah had to, to question. In the Jewish writing, he says there, he says there that because, say that, because they did not look at the Torah as something that was a gift that came from God. Therefore, say that, therefore, the protection, say that the protection, the blessing, the blessing, the transformation that the word of God should have happened in their lives did that affect them. Why? Because they didn't look at it as a blessing. Amen? I still hear. So if, if we're trying to learn Torah because we want to be wise, we want to be, you know, to be a good uh, 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 Bible study leader, it's not going to work. Say, it's not going to work. Because the word of God is supposed to what? Is to benefit us. Amen? The word of God is supposed to what? To bless us. And the only way, the only way that the word of God is going to bless you and I is when we look at the word of God as a blessing. Amen? Amen. So our attitude, you know, when we look at the Torah as a burden, then it's not going to bless you. This word is not going to bless you. The same way that the, I was saying, you know, why God, they're studying the Torah. How come they did not move away from idolatry? How come they did not move away from sexual immorality? How come they didn't move away from murder? Why? Because the word was not received, say that, was not received with gratitude, with thanksgiving. Amen? Amen. You know, and, and as a result, the word did not change them. So Ram Sadak says, yeah, the, the, in, in, Mar, in the book of Mar, but book one is the holy idea, book three is, is the disintegration, and book two is the transition based on leaving Mount Sinai, right? So their disdain for the Torah, their, their hatred of the Torah will result in the Torah not helping you either. So that means if you don't appreciate the Torah as a gift for which they would have expressed gratitude and, and appreciation, they learned the Torah, uh, they kept the mitzvah other than the big three, the sin. The Torah, they learned, say that the Torah, they learned, did not protect them from the sin of idolatry, from the from sexual morality of murder. Why? Because they did not see the Torah as a source of blessing and gratitude. Amen? I tell you. And giving back to God, right? Amen? How do we know that? Go to the next slide because remember, um, the, 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 so, so the destruction happened because of, uh, and then later on, what happened? They, they established this prayer that, we, that we, we, we chant every Shabbat when we read the Torah. So that, that, that chant. And uh, we see here that, uh, you know, uh, you see here that the attitude of the people. Go to the next slide. So here we see that. In Numbers chapter 11, they, the big multitude that was among them fell lasting, and the children of Israel also wept in their part and said, what were, what would what we were given flesh to eat? They remember the fish which were, which were want, they want, they want to eat in Egypt for, for, for free. You know, the fish were free, they said, the cucumbers and the melons, the leeks, the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is by the way. There's nothing at all. We have taught this manna to look at. So they, they had a disdain for the manna. God gave them provision. They, they look at the manna as a... They were not happy. They say, say that. They were not happy. Why? Because if the manna really... They're, what is, what they, they're, they're rejecting God. You see that... that uh, the nation of Israel expressed by wailing over the manna. They were, they were, they were, they were mourning as if somebody died in their family. They hate the manna so much. Are you still here? Amen. And they remember, they they forgot how bad it was. They were they were slaves in Egypt. Are you still here? And yet they said, you know, if you notice, everything that they were longing for are all under the under 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 the sea or under the ground amen <laughs> they're looking for 
the things of this world are still here. Right? The, the, the leeks are under the ground. The onion under the ground. The garlics, imagine the fish under the water. So everything that the world was seeking. And see, they're saying they were better off before they received the Torah. Are you still here? If you go to, uh, so, so the commandment instruction is not just go next time. What is the purpose we learn? Uh, the, the, so the rejection. So you see here, they 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 forgot how how bad they, their life was before the before God took them. Why? Because they so disdain the word of God. They, they they hate the word of God. They want to go back to their old old life. I tell you, go next time. So the rejection of the manna is really a rejection of God's word because the purpose of the manna really is to prove whether or not we're going to follow God's ways or not. I tell you, God is testing us. God is testing us in this world. Are we going to follow his ways or are we going to follow man? Are you still here? Yeah. So it came, so he says there that uh, verse 27, it came to pass on the seventh day that they went out, some of the people, to gather and they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my law? So God is, is, uh, is disappointed that they refuse to follow God's ways. Amen. So uh, I think I have another side going next side. So we learned that Yeshua is the man. Say Yeshua is the man. Yeshua is the man. He said to them, No, what miracle will you do for us that we may see and trust you? What work can you perform? Our father ate man or manna in the desert. It says in the Tanakh, he gave them bread from heaven. Yeshua said to them, Yes, indeed, I tell you, it wasn't Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my Father is giving you the genuine bread from heaven. God's bread is the one who comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. So you see here that how Yeshua connected the manna that they rejected. So the rejection of the manna resulted in what? The disintegration of the ideal society, right? They started to, to the Korak rebellion, they started the the complaining about the manna and all. So it, it, it just spiraled from there. Amen. So we learn here that Yeshua is the living manna. The sign. He said, are you going to follow my way? Yeshua is asking the same to our generation today. Are you going to follow him? Amen. Amen. We we read the second part. Or, uh, or sister, sister Sophia read the second part of John chapter 15. The first part, he says, if you love me, he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Amen? So, uh, so he says here that, um, I think I have another slide, Jesse, in the chat. Um, yeah, so, so, so uh, verse 52, how can this man give us flesh? And she said to him, in the SID, I tell you that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourself. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. That I will raise him in the last day. So he's talking about his word. Say his word. His word. He's not talking about eating his flesh. He's talking about his word. That is uh, his word is, uh, is the flesh. The, the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help. The word that I've spoken. Say the word that I've spoken. They are spirit and life. Amen. Their spirit and life. So go next slide. So so we see here that many today replace with theology, right? We know that they don't believe in the commandments and instruction of God and replace it with man-made doctrines. We have replaced the Jewishness with a pagan way, right? They rejected the idea of commandments and allowed super grace that are giving many to live like the world and still claim. To be followers of the Messiah, right? He says, replacement the Torah is Israel is replaced, the Torah is replaced, Shabbat is replaced, the name of the Savior is replaced. Yes. God peace and calendar replaced, and finally God's laws, food laws replaced. But Yeshua said, Yeshua lived the Torah, lived the Torah, that Yeshua loved Israel, Yeshua loved the Jewish people. Yeshua is 
the living Torah. So, so today, go next. So, so we see here that the key here really is book two. See, the key, say the key, the key is book two, which is the two verses. The first verse it says there, and it came to pass when the ark set out forward that Moses said, "Rise up, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you." Flee before you. So what is what is what is this passage talking about? It's talking about what, what we read in John, what Sophia read in John. He said they hate obedience to his word. They hate the living Torah. They hate Hashem hates them too. Hashem will scatter them. And this is what happened. So in book three, because they hated the Torah, the word of God, what happened? God scattered them. They scattered them. God scattered them. So, so God said, the key there, those, arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. So God said, the, the enemy of the Torah, the enemy of his word, he will scatter them. Amen? Verse 23, what Sophia read, whoever hates me, hates my father also. If I do not, if I have not done in their present works, which no one else ever did, why would why would not they be guilty of sin? But now they have seen them and they have hated both me and my father. So God said, those who hate me, he will scatter them. Amen, I tell you. Yes. And then goes to the next slide. The good news is, verse 36, and let it, and then when the, the ark rested, talking about God's presence rested, return, O Lord. Unto the ten thousands of the family of Israel. So, so here there is going to be a a returning. Say that there's going to be a returning. Say that returning. Return. Isaiah fifty five. It's a messianic prophecy. It says that you will summon a nation you you do not know, and a nation that doesn't know you will run to you. The nations will hear about the Messiah. You will hear about the Torah. They will run to the Torah for the sake of Adonai your God, the Holy One of Israel, who will glorify you. Seek Adonai while he's available. Call on him while he's still nearby. Let the wicked person abandon his way and the evil person his thoughts. Let them return to Adonai and he will have mercy on them. Let him return to our God and he will freely forgive. Amen. So that's uh, that's the key. The, that's the key. Uh, our love of God and our, you know, when we love His His commandment, it will bless. You. If you love His word, He will bless. You. Amen. If you walk in His way, He will it will bless. You. Amen. So to conclude today, Israel's problem, mankind's problem began when they and we reject the man and the word of God, His Torah. And really, Yeshua, the living Torah, amen, that came down from heaven. So the question that we have before you, do you really love God so that you, you will be willing to obey his Torah in our lives? Or is our relationship based on convenience? What is convenience to you and to me? Amen. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you today. Albino Malkino, our father, our king. We just lift up every family, every household, everyone that listens to your word today, Father. Let's go touch your people today. May the word become alive in their lives. Let us love the word, and the word, your word, will love us back. Amen? Amen. Let your word bless your people, because your people are beginning or are loving your word. We ask in Yeshua the Messiah. And everybody said, Amen. amen, amen, amen. And uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see you back next time.